But who brought their Bibles? The sword. Good, good, good. Look at all these swords out here. You got a, you got a sheath for your sword. That's nice. Nice. I'm not like pastor. I don't hate on the digital swords. Um, I'm not my preference, but I'm not gonna diss you for, you know, bringing your phone. Like, what are you, what are you gonna do? All right. Well, um, let's 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 just pray before we. I think it's always good to just pray more than you have to. Um, Jesus, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for your grace, for your mercy. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we don't have to question or wonder if we're hearing your voice because we have your written word. And so when you do speak to us, we can know for sure that it's you because everything that you speak to us will line up with your holy inerrant word, Lord. Jesus, we're so, so thankful for the scriptures, Lord. It is the bread of life. And Jesus, we just ask you that you would break it for us this evening, that you would take these, these words on this, on this page and you would actually bring it forth because it's living and you would bring it forth and that it would produce a wellspring of life in our hearts. Lord, you said that your words are spirit and they are life. And so, Lord, we're going to treat them like that. We are going to read your scripture, eat your scripture, digest your scripture like it is life, like it is our life, because it is. And we have no life outside of the the guidance that you've provided here, Lord. So, Lord, once again, we thank you, and we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Man. All right, well, um, not last week, because I was gone last week. I was in Minnesota. Did my first wedding. Uh, it was good. I was very nervous. I've actually never been so nervous. Like even the first time I spoke at big church, I actually wasn't really that nervous because I'm like, it's just regular preaching with a few more people. But this whole, like the doing the wedding thing, that was like, this is like recorded. I get one shot. There is no, oh, got next sermon. Nope. This is my, (laughs) this is my one shot. And on top of that, it was my cousin and my best friend in the entire world. Um, and so I, I felt an immense amount of pressure. And that's a good thing, right? I think when, when you feel pressure about something, it means that you care. Um, and so I did. I felt pressure. But it all went really good. Um, I gave. Luckily, his pastor was very kind and helped me with a good just outline for the officiating. Um, and then really all I had to do was was preach my little marriage message that I had. Um, Genesis, Genesis 2. I just talked out of Genesis 2. But um, you guys will hear it whenever you guys get married, if you let me do your wedding, which I'd love to. He said, I bet. (laughs) But anyway, uh, so not last week, but the week before, I started a message series. And like I said before, not really a big, like, series guy. It's not like my... It's not just, it's just not how I think. Like, I don't think, I don't plan my life four weeks ahead of time, let alone my, my messages. <laughs> um, but uh, this specific series um, and topic of discussion, I just felt like was, was really heavy on my heart for you guys, for this generation, and specifically for this moment in time. And I think the send yesterday was just... Um, it was affirmation for me that this this message is for us now. Uh, and so for those of you who weren't here, this, this series is called Becoming Bethany. And uh, just to give you a brief recap, what Bethany is in Scripture is, it is a, it's a physical town. It's a physical little village outside of Jerusalem where 
multiple times throughout the Gospels, it is depicted of Jesus actually physically resting there. Jesus was a lot of places. He did a lot of traveling all around Israel and that region. Um, but very, very seldom is it actually depicted of him actually being able to sit and rest, like physically rest, like sit down, kick his feet up, take a nap. He took a nap on the boat, but that's a, you know, that's a whole other, <laughs> that's a whole other can of worms. That, was so that, yeah, that was, he was teaching through that. But this, like, um, it's, it's literally depicted, it literally depicts him resting, like just really kicking his feet up and resting. And so that's, that's what we need to be. We, our lives, our hearts need to be resting places for the Lord. Um, we need to be people who love the Lord so dearly and are so sensitive to him that his spirit not only dwells in us, but actually rests upon us. Um, I've heard a preacher say that uh, people say that, that God doesn't have favorites. Um, but that's not entirely true because God has favor, right? So he has favor on certain people. So that means in a way he does have favorites. That's not to say that he loves anyone more than any other person. He loves us all equally, uh, saved and lost, sinner and saint. He loves everyone the same you know, John 3, 16, so God so loved the world that he gave. That word, the world, means everybody, right? But he does have favorites in the sense that some people listen to his word. Some people are more sensitive to the guidance of his spirit. Some people are more likely to listen to that still, small voice that is the voice of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we should strive for as Christians is being a place of, I'm going to say, use the word refuge, but refuge depicts like we're like rescuing the Lord, which is not at all true. He rescued us, never the other way around. But we do want to be a place where we're not always in opposition to his will. We should not constantly, he shouldn't constantly be having to like yank the chains on the reins of our lives, you know, like to the best of our ability, we should be bending ourselves to whatever he wants uh, with as minimal resistance as possible. And the caveat to this whole series is we are always going to be going through the process of sanctification. He is always going to be challenging us, purifying us, trying to remove the world from us. So we have to keep that in mind. Like, we're never going to be perfect, not on, not on this side of eternity. However, I do think that there is this, there is an ability for us here on earth to actually be a resting place for the Lord. We're going to get into this next week, but Psalm 138 actually talks about what the Lord wants, and that is a resting place, a dwelling place, it actually says in, in Psalms 138, a dwelling place here on the earth. And in the Old Testament, that dwelling place was known as the Ark of the Covenant that was inside the temple, right? You know about this. But in this new covenant that we live in, we're the temple. Our bodies are the temple, and the Holy Spirit lives in us. And so there are some people, <laughs> some Christians, the Holy Spirit lives in them, um, but he has to do a lot of adjustments, like all the time, <laughs> or at least is trying to. Uh, and that, like, once again, that's not to say that we're not ever going to have things that the Lord has to adjust in us, because we definitely will. Um, but our heart posture, our goal should be, Lord, I want, I want you to feel welcomed and wanted in my life and in every facet of my life. 
I want you to feel welcomed and wanted. And so, um, anyway, so yeah, this is this is the series we're in. It's called Becoming Bethany. Um, and so last week we looked at the different accounts of Bethany. Um, usually the highlight of the all of these accounts is Mary uh, anointing Jesus' feet. And in some accounts it says he anoint, she anoints his head um, with costly perfume. Um, but let's just recap. I want to go to Luke chapter 10. And I think we're just going to start in verse 38. Now as they were on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but only one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. So, so he is, Jesus is, the one thing needed. He is the one thing necessary. This is, this is a foundational truth of Christianity. Jesus is it. Uh, I like what Pastor John will often say. There is no Jesus plus. It is, it's, it's just Jesus. He is it. He's the only thing needed. But to a person who has committed their life to becoming a Bethany or a resting place for the Spirit of the Lord or the presence of the Lord here on the earth, to a person is, who has committed their life, to becoming a Bethany. Not only is Jesus the only thing needed, but he is actually the only thing wanted. There is a simplicity of longing that comes with having a heart of Bethany, having a lifestyle of Bethany. Um, I think it's such an epidemic in the Western American world that we as Christians, we want it's kind of like the phrase, we want our cake uh, and, or what is it? We want our cake and eat it too. I don't know why I mixed that expression up. But we want our cake and we want to eat it too. But there is no mixing of oils. There is no, I get to be friends with the world and be friends with Jesus. James, the book of James has a lot to say about that. It actually says that friendship with the world is enmity with God. And that word enmity means hostility. It means you are in opposition to God when you are friends with the world. And so that's why you hear Christians use the phrase, we are in the world, but we are not of it. We, our citizenship is in heaven and heaven alone. And so Jesus is not only the only thing that we need, but to the ones who are committing themselves to being a resting place for him, Jesus is the only thing that we actually want. We sing it in so many worship songs like, you're, like, you're all I want, Lord. Like, Jesus, you're it. You're everything. You're all I want. Your presence is everything. But then we go home and we're like, well, I would love your presence, but I would also, you know, like to, you know, binge watch Netflix or um, be addicted to scrolling on Facebook and Instagram or or, you know, what, insert whatever you want. But anything that distracts from the Lord, right? So he is the only thing wanted. And I believe when the people of God commit their lives, and we are, by the way, we are the people of God. It doesn't matter that you are in high school or in middle school. You are the church. There is no junior Holy Spirit. There is no distinction between 40-year-old Christian and 10-year-old Christian. You're all Christians in the Lord's eyes. But I believe when the people of God commit their lives to becoming resting places for the presence of God, then we will begin to see a shift in the cultures of our environments. For some of us, this can mean um, impacting an entire city or community. 
For some of us, this can mean simply just impacting our classrooms or our families or even maybe just your sibling. But regardless, the world we live in is in desperate need for the spirit of Jesus to have his way in his people, right? Getting back to what I talked about before. No, the Lord doesn't love anybody more than anybody else, but he does have favor on certain people. Um, And his favor, I think we have a bad representation of the word favor as well. A lot of people think of favor as like um, you get a spot close to the door at like Meyer. Like, oh, favor. The Lord has favor on me. He gave me this good parking spot. Um, but in my mind, I think the ultimate proof of the Lord's favor on somebody is actually somebody's ability to hear his voice clearly. Um, there, there, there is something so special about having that relationship with the Lord that when he whispers, and it is still, and it is a small voice, and uh, he's not a God that yells a lot. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. He's not forcing you. He's not yelling at you to do anything. He gives gentle nudges, gentle invitations into obedience. But we have to have a tenderness to him in order to even hear that voice. And I think the favor of God is so well proven when people hear his voice clearly. Like, it's, it's amazing to be able to hear the voice of the Lord, guys. Um, but the world desperately needs that. The world, I want you to really hear me in this. The world needs you to hear his voice. Your classroom needs you to hear the voice of God. Your family needs you to hear the voice of God. Our city needs you and I to hear the voice of God and then take a step of faith into obedience to his voice. That is what this world needs. And so the only way that I see it, the scriptural way that I see it, the biblical way that I see that this could be possible is if we commit our lives to becoming a place of resting for the spirit of the Lord in our lives and in our hearts. Not just, I prayed the prayer, I'm saved, you know, I got, the, I got my, my, whole, my ticket punched into heaven. It's, it's beyond that. It's, I'm not living to escape this reality. I'm living that the Lamb of God would receive the reward of his suffering. And he saved me. And because his kindness saved me, I will live my life with a holy passion to bring as many people with me to eternity as possible. That is the heart of Bethany. And that is the heart that Jesus had for us. And that is the heart that he asks us to have for the world around us. Amen? And so... When you spend that time early in the morning reading the scriptures and you're tired and you got crust in your eyes and man, sometimes you get by lunchtime, you can't even remember what you read this morning. Just know that those little moments of being a living sacrifice, right? Romans 12 to, says to not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds, by changing the way we think, so that we could offer up ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God. And those just little moments of just like, I'm going to get up 30 minutes before I absolutely need to get up so I can get ready and spend a half hour in the morning to get in the Word and spend some time in prayer. It's those little moments of being little living sacrifices that add up and they give you a sensitivity to his voice. There's only one way to know someone's voice without looking directly at them and it is spending time and conversating. 
You, you ever like realize that like there are some people you know so well that if they call you and even if you don't see who's calling, like you know, you just know their voice, like your parents. You just know your parents' voice. Like you, you don't have to look at them. They can say like half a syllable and you know their voice. But there are some people like you've only talked to once or twice, like they could say a whole sentence and you'd still be like, yeah, I, I don't know whose voice that is. The only way to recognize the voice of God in those, in those moments where it counts is to have that history with him, to have that, that time logged in the secret place. And so when you're in that secret place, and it, and it can honestly, it feel, sometimes it feels like such a drag. Prayer is not always fun. I don't think it's supposed to be, actually. I think the actual design of prayer is that it is killing the flesh. It is not pleasant for the flesh to spend long amounts of time in prayer. I'm not saying like, yeah, like when the Lord's presence comes and that happens from time, from time to time where his presence just so comes so strongly in a moment that like this is, that you're like, I don't, I don't want to leave at all. This is where I want to be. But there are most of those times in prayer where um, you're kind of just looking at the clock. You're like, all right, when, when can I be done praying? Um, but that's the moments that we're, we're actually getting, we're, we're going deep. It doesn't feel like it, but you're getting, you're, you're going into the depths of him in those moments of mundane commitment. Yes, it's boring sometimes, but you're developing a relationship with him by just spending that time. But the presence of God, guys, the presence of God is powerful and it shifts environments wherever it is, but he needs willing vessels. He needs people who are willing to carry the presence and spirit of God into a room so that he can transform the room. He's the one that has the transformative power. You do not. I do not have any power to transform your lives. He does, though. But he chooses in his divine wisdom to use vessels, human vessels, to carry his spirit and actually be catalysts to transformation in the world around them. So from here, I want to go to John chapter 11. And we'll start in verse 28. Oh, I'm a little too far. John 11, when you're there, say amen. Just so I know you're there. Uh, 28, starting in verse 28. So, I'm trying to look real quick here. Make sure I have the right. Okay. So in this passage of scripture, um, this man named Lazarus, who was a, a friend of Jesus. He wasn't a disciple, but he was a friend of Jesus. This man named Lazarus had been, got, had, he had gotten sick. And at this point, he is actually dead. And so this is where we're picking up in the story. Um, and we're, we're looking in on Mary and Martha, who are Lazarus's uh, sisters. And when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not come into the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
just think just think about think about that your your sibling who you love dearly has just died and you've been waiting on Jesus you've been you've been praying you've anointed them with oil you've laid your hands on them you've done everything you know to do and you're waiting on Jesus to show up and it seems like he shows up late and so she says to him I mean this is just desperation Lord if you had been here if you would have just showed up Lord if you had been here my brother would have not died and when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept his friend from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, did I, not tell, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Mm, that's such a scripture, guys. Did I not tell you that if you had believed, you would, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I knew that you always, and I know that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you have sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him. Unbind him and let him go. That's the presence of Jesus. That is the power of the presence of Jesus. And Mary, to some extent, understood. She knew enough to say, Lord, if you had been here, if you would have showed up, if your presence would have come, my brother wouldn't be dead right now. But she had um, a base level understanding of the power of the presence of God. And so I love that scripture. Jesus said, says back to her, didn't I tell you that if you would believe that you would see the glory of God? As if to say, like, watch this. <laughs> it's, it's the like, uh, the Babe Ruth calling a shot. He's like, watch this. I'm about to, I'm about to knock this out of the park. And Jesus moved with compassion. He says, Lazarus, come out. I, lo I love that too. Jesus didn't play the church games, the say a bunch of Christianese prayers. He understood his authority and he, and he spoke directly to Laz Lazarus, come forth, as the King James says. Lazarus, come forth. And so, yeah, Mary understood that he, he, he can heal the sick. He can make someone better. She had yet to realize that not only can Jesus, can the presence of Jesus make someone better, he can raise the dead to life. And guys, that same spirit that raised, that called Lazarus, from the grave, the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead lives in you. That same spirit lives in you and me. And each and every day, he beckons us to not only share the gospel. Yesterday, those of you who went to the Seine, 
we talked a lot about sharing the gospel, but we read throughout these accounts in Scripture, the gospel is actually a lot more than just a story. The gospel is a reality that you step into. To Lazarus, the gospel was not just a cool story. To Lazarus, was the, gosp- the gospel was, I was dead, and then in a moment my eyes opened and I was back to life. The, the gospel was, an, was a reality that he experienced. And so each and every day, the Holy Spirit that lives in us is beckoning us and asking us to be examples, to be testimonies of the grace and power of God in our lives, in, in our day, in our, in our communities. He beckons us to do these things. And he's looking for people who will respond in obedience like Christ did. Jesus said, I don't, I don't do anything that I don't see my heavenly Father doing. And the reason that Jesus could see what was happening in the heavenlies was because he had the Holy Spirit. This is, you know, this is, you know, kind of ABCs of Christian theology here, but that's that's a huge thing. We actually have the ability to see into the spirit realm, which is, you know, beyond what our physical eyes can see. But we can see into the spirit, into the heavenlies. And if we're sensitive to his voice, we actually can know what he wants to do. Um, this, is, this is what my goal is for services. Like when we have services and we're, when we're in worship, more than I want to just, you know, rip through a, a set of songs, I want to actually hear and tap into what he wants to say. He is the great worship leader. And we are the best worship leaders. I'll say that in air quotes. We're the best worship leaders when we're actually worship followers. When we're following him into what he wants to do. And it's the same in every facet of our life. You are the most like Christ when you're following what he wants to do. Mind-blowing, right? But that, that is the power of the presence of God. When, when Jesus steps into a room, right? The presence of God, I don't want to confuse you guys and make, make the presence or spirit of God seem like this like mystical like mist that like comes into a room. No, like the presence of God is literally just God in the room. Like he's there. That's what it is. It's, 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 no, it's not any more profound than that. It's just, no, God's here. God's here. He's in this room. And yes, he is uh, omnipresent, which means he's everywhere all at once. But there are thin spaces. There are moments in time where heaven gets real close to earth. And what you'll realize as you go throughout this Christian life is you'll notice a, a pattern in those moments when heaven is close to earth. And, is, and it is when Jesus is wanted in that, in that space. Uh, yesterday, we heard, um, we heard a, a preacher say that Jesus comes where he's wanted. And that's what we want to do, right? Like We want to invite Jesus. This is why we gather up and we pray the way that we do. We want Jesus here. But not only, guys, do I want Jesus to come to our meetings and come to our gatherings. I actually want him to stay. And so let's go now uh, to the next next page. Turn the page to John 12. And I want to read this account of Bethany again. And I really want to hone in on Lazarus here. I got 10 minutes. Here we go. So six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead, uh, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave him a, a dinner there and Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. And Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment and made, made, made of pure nard 
and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. And then we're going to skip down a few verses to verse 9. And then it says, when the large crowd of the Jews, when a large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And so the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus, Lazarus to death as well. Because remember, they wanted to kill Jesus. Because the message that he was preaching threatened their political hierarchy. That was really what it all came down to. The message that Jesus preached threatened their earthly position. And so they wanted to kill him. So now they're saying they also want to kill Lazarus as, as well because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So just, just wrap your mind around this, guys. The the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders of the time, hated Jesus so much that they, they wanted to put him to death. And so they were, they were contriving different plans. Of how are we going to kill Jesus? How are we going to get rid of him? And so then they literally witness him raise a man from the dead who had been dead for four days. Like he wasn't just dead. He was like dead, dead. Like D-E-D, dead. Like... <laughs> He was dead, man. And they watched him raise him from the grave. He called him forth from the grave, removed the, the grave cloths from him. And they said, and they, and instead of being amazed and awestruck, like they should have been, they were pissed. <laughs> they were mad. And they were like, not only are we killing Jesus, we're killing this guy too. Because I don't know what he did, but I don't like it. <laughs> like just, I mean, that, lo that logic. I was, I was like, I was reading this today, and I don't know why I'd never like really like paid much attention to it. I was like, the logic of this, I just don't follow for some reason. Like, Lazarus gets raised from the dead, and it makes them mad. So they're like, we're killing him too. That's like. When you're like mad at your friend and you're like, screw you, dude. And then like someone else, like his other friend walks in the room and he like, screw him too. And he's like, what do I do? Like, it's like, <laughs> it's like that type of energy. <laughs> but anyway, I just, that part just boggles my mind. Um, but that's not actually the part I want to look at. So going back up to uh, verse 2. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. And Mary, obviously, is the, always the highlight of these stories, what Mary did, anointing his feet with oil and wiping his feet with her hair and her tears. That's always the highlight of the story. But I, I, I was really drawn to this part of the verse where it talks about what Lazarus was doing. Lazarus had been raised from the dead. And so the after party, dinner at Martha and Mary's house, um, he's, he's reclining with Jesus at the table. So Jesus is resting. And the part that I think is really significant is Lazarus was resting with him. Never underestimate the power of, of taking a moment of stillness and rest with Jesus. When we rest in him, he can actually rest in us. Because he's the one, he's the one that makes us acceptable for his spirit. Like he prepares our hearts for him. And so to become a Bethany, to be a resting place for the Lord, it actually means that we need to allow Him to prepare our hearts to host His presence, and to host His Spirit. I want 
to be a resting place for the Lord, guys. I don't know about you. Wherever he is, I want to actually do all three of these things. All three of these siblings, I think, depict a facet of what a heart of Bethany, what a lifestyle of Bethany should look like. Martha served. Lazarus sat at the table, listened to his words. And Mary was undone at his feet in worship. And I think all three of those things are pillars in the lifestyle of Bethany. To serve him with full zeal. To listen and engage with him with full obedience. And to worship him with no dignity. That is the lifestyle of Bethany. And it is so, it is so my heart to see this in you guys. It is so my heart to see it in myself. Like, like this is something that we can always be growing in. I want to, I want to serve him more. I want to listen to him deeper. I want to rest with him more often. I want to worship him with more of myself. I want to pour more of my value and my costly oil out on him. I want to do these things because he's worthy. And it is my great honor and privilege to sacrifice my life to live like this. To live this Bethany resting place for the Lord lifestyle. And if this is the cross I must bear, if this is the, the cross I carry, then I will gladly do it. It's amazing how Jesus tells us that unless you pick up your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. And so many of us think that, oh, unless we're being like persecuted or unless we're being picked on as Christians, then we're not bearing our cross. And there is an aspect of that that's true. There is an aspect of, yes, if you are living in, in a lifestyle of faith, dedicating yourself to Jesus, then yes, there is going to be opposition. There is going to be people that don't like that. Obviously, we just read about it. Like <laughs> Lazarus didn't do anything but get raised from the dead, and they were mad at him for it. <laughs> um, so obviously, being a testimony of the gospel will just tick people off. It's just part of it. But that, I would say, is the secondary cross of the Christian lifestyle. Because honestly, how many times on a weekly basis, are you being persecuted for your faith by, like, another person? Like, very rarely is someone actually, like, hostile towards you for being a Christian. But how often do you neglect the secret place because of your own comfort? Now, that's the primary cross we must be bearing. That's the primary thing. So whenever I hear people like, and it's usually because they get into arguments on comment sections. <laughs> They're like, I'm bearing my cross, brother. I'm like, no, you're just being mean, dude. Like, that's all you're doing. You're just, you're just being a doofus on Facebook. Like, and, I, and so like, I, I literally do. I think like, how's your secret place, brother? <laughs> like, how much of that cross are you bearing? How much of your own life are you burying in a place of prayer? What's so significant about that secret place, that secret place of prayer, is you'll never get any earthly glory for it. No one's, like, you'll get, you'll get some praise for a, good, for a good message, for a good sermon. You'll never get praise for a good secret place encounter. That is between you and the Lord. But that is the place that I think and I believe that we get to see the most glory here on earth is in that secret place. And that's the cross, guys. 
And if that's, if that's all you pull from this, that better is to, to bear the cross of a hidden lifestyle than anything else, then, then you take that with you. That's, that's what I want you to hear from this. But if we will do this, this is, this is wrapping, around, wrapping this around. My point of this is, if we will do this habitually, routinely, not out of religion, but out of a relationship, a loving relationship, if we will do this routinely, then you will find yourself in moments in your life where you're actually, you take a step, you know, maybe it's in your high school and the Lord starts to speak to you maybe about that person that you sit next with, ne- next to in class or your locker buddy or your teammate at sports. World. But you just, you hone in on his voice more easily when you've spent time hearing it privately. And I believe a shift in this generation will be not, uh, well, sorry, I got ahead of myself here. So yeah, he comes where he's wanted and that goes for our every aspect of our lives. And I want to also say he, he not only comes where he's wanted, but he stays where he's listened to. And that's the point of me highlighting this thing about Lazarus is he was resting and reclining with Jesus at the table and listening and engaging with his voice. He comes where he's wanted, but he stays where he's listened to. And to a Hebrew person, by the way, we think of listening as as simply hearing. But in this ancient language, we have it translated to English, but in this ancient language, that word listen or hear, obedience was connected to that. Like, if you heard a command but didn't obey it, they would say you didn't hear it. If you listened to, a, to, a, to the Lord telling you what to do, but you didn't obey when you listened, then you didn't hear. You didn't listen to that at all. And so he stays where he's listened to. And I believe a shift in this generation will be not only, will be, I word, what the heck is that? my right in here? I worded this so funny. I believe, I believe a shift in this generation will be not only ones that will, who invite him, but we'd actually be people who beckon him to stay. Okay, yeah, so basically what I'm saying is, I believe in this generation, we're going to be people who not only invite him in to live with us, to be people that not only say the prayer, essentially. We don't just say the prayer of salvation, but we actually want him to stay and be welcomed in our life, to, to move us and guide us wherever he wants. Jesus will rest on a people that focus solely on him when he comes. And so to become a Bethany Jesus must be the focus. He must be the influencer, and he must be the leader. And I already described this, but the layout of this dinner table is so pure. It's so, it's such, it's such a picture of what our lives need to be, a place where he is served, where he is listened to, and where he is worshiped. Best weapon is a weapon you only have to fire once. I know. <laughs> Classic. Um, anyway. That's <laughs> so funny. Um, <laughs> that's Iron Man, isn't it? <laughs> Gosh, that lady's like, I'm out of here, dude. I'm out of here. <laughs> okay. Um, well, anyway, I'm going to wrap this up. I got two more sentences to read. But when we have, when our lives look like this, our lives look like serving Jesus, our lo- lives look like listening to Jesus, and our lives look like worshiping Jesus, 
It is very clear to everyone who looks at our lives who the center of attention is in our life. And when people know who the center of our life is, they will be drawn to that. So what I'm suggesting to you is this. Our lives should resemble this little scene in this dining room in Bethany. There is much happening, but it's extraordinarily clear who the center and leader is. And so this is, this is what I want you guys to take from this message today. Sit with Jesus. Listen to his voice. Become familiar with silence in his presence. Because when, when we're familiar with just the silence of his presence, we allow our hearts to look away from just simply being busy. Because that's the culture, right? That's the culture we live in is, is we gotta be busy. We gotta be productive. There's, we gotta make this thing happen. We gotta keep things moving. And so we take that mentality into the secret place. And we take that into our time spent in his presence. And we're like, Lord, come on. Like, you know, you got a word for me. I need, I need some revelation. I need some encouragement so I can get up out of here and get on my day. And the Lord's like, why don't you just sit with me for a moment? Why don't you just be here with me? And it's amazing how productive that nothingness is how spiritually productive it is. There's no earthly measurement for it, but you are doing so much in the heavenly realm when you just visit with him. And when you become so aware, the sound of silence in his presence, you want to know what? In his presence, you want to know what? You then become aware when that silence is broken by his voice. It's loud when you're used to silence, right? You guys ever, like, who here sleeps with a fan at night? Most of us, okay. I literally need a fan. Like, I can't sleep without a fan. I need the, brrr, I need it. I need it blowing on my face. I, I need to be cold. But a case, like, I just had this happen. Like, I've had this box fan for like four years, and this thing's been rolling 24-7, never turn it off, that thing just stays on, and all of a sudden, like, I like turned it off one day, and I went to go turn it back on, and it was like, <laughs> and it like, the, <laughs> the motor broke in it, and I was like, and I was about to go to bed, and I was like, I'm not, <sighs> so I'm like, well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to, like, go to Walmart and buy a new fan right now. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, I, well, actually, I thought about doing that, but I just don't like all the other noises. I just like that white noise. I just like that, like, just nothingness. And so I just like, well, all right. Oh, you want to know what? I think I watched YouTube videos until I fell asleep, not going to lie. Do, I, do, I, I do not recommend that. It's no. not a terrible way to fall asleep. <laughs> But I just like I needed some noise. But my phone died eventually. I'm getting to the point of this story. I promise you there's a point. So eventually, my phone died, and I, I ended up falling asleep in, in silence, in nothingness. And I remember I woke up, and obviously there's no fan, there's no fan sound, there's nothing. And I remember my room was like, oh my this it's so quiet in here, it's loud. Like, that's how quiet it is. And then I remember I, um, what did I do? Oh, yeah, I got up and I went to the bathroom and I, sh I flipped the, the light on that has the fan, like, you know, in the, in the ceiling or whatever. And I flipped that fan on. I'm like, holy smokes, that fan is loud. But it's really not. I just got so familiar with the silence that when the silence was broken, it was like thundering. That's my point, okay? You become so familiar with the silence of his presence that when the voice interrupts that silence, it's like it thunders. It's so clear. 
So yeah, God, spend time in silence with the Lord. You you will not you will not um, you'll not regret that. But I'm gonna pray for us and then. Lord, just thank you so much for what you're doing in this generation. I thank you so much for your word, and I thank you that you want to mold us and shape us into people that you can rest upon. Lord, I want you to rest on my life. I don't want to be in opposition to you. I don't want to be an interruption to your will. Lord, I want to be an open and cleared out vessel for you to flow through as you will. Lord, steer me and guide me, Lord. I want to be a, a, a resting place, a Bethany. Make me a Bethany, Lord. Make us Bethany's, Jesus. Lord, we love you with all our heart and all our mind and all our soul and all our strength. And it's in Jesus' name that we